Okay, in this video lecture, we're going to be talking about the anatomy of the nervous system and the focus will be on the central nervous system for the first part uh, of this chapter. So in order to study the brain, we have to examine the embryonic development of the brain. The brain and all other nervous tissue forms from the ectoderm. During embryonic development, ultimately thin, flat layers of ectoderm begin to thicken to form the neural plate, which then invaginates to form the neural groove, which is also sometimes referred to as the neural fold. Essentially, two sides of the neural groove touch, forming an internal passageway called the neuroseal. This structure is then called the neural tube. Uh, the anterior end of the neural tube begins to enlarge, forming three prominent divisions. And uh, here you can see those. Now with the formation of the primary brain vesicles, um, you know, then you have the beginnings of, of our, our nervous system. And in particular, here you can see that you have the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. So that's really where we're, uh, that's where we're starting from. Now, somewhere around week five of development, the primary brain vesicles have changed position, and the forebrain and high brain, or hindbrain rather, uh, have further subdivided to form secondary brain vesicles. The midbrain does not significantly change during development. Now, as development continues, however, the cerebrum enlarges to the point where it covers the other portions of the brain. And you can also see here in this slide what the forebrain and highbrain structures become in the adult. The forebrain ultimately becomes a cerebrum, which is then uh, you know, the cerebral cortex, white matter, and the basal nuclei. In addition, it forms the thalamus and the pineal gland and the hypothalamus, uh, both very important structures, and we'll learn more about those in the endocrine chapter. Uh, but we also have the hind hindbrain, which forms the brain stem and the pons and the cerebellum, uh, as well as the medulla oblongata. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the major parts of the brain. Uh, first off, the brain contains almost 97% of the body's neural tissue, and the typical adult brain weighs somewhere around three, three pounds. Now, brain size does vary considerably among individuals, and on average, the brain of males are about 10% larger than those of females, which gives rise to the difference in body sizes we see between men and women. But there has not, let me repeat, there has not been any correlations found between brain size and intelligence by gender. Individuals with small, the smallest brains uh, and the largest brains, they both have both uh, the ability to function normally. Now, the brain possesses four fluid-filled chambers, which we will examine later on, called ventricles, and the ventricles contain cerebral spinal fluid, which we'll just abbreviate CSF. The major regions of the brain are the cerebrum, the cerebellum, the diencephalon, and the brainstem, and the midbrain. And we're going to take a look at each of these structures uh, in the next few slides. Okay, so starting with the cerebrum. Now, the cerebrum accounts for about 80% of the brain's mass, so it's pretty big. The cerebrum, it functions in conscious thought and memory storage and processing, also sensory processing, and the regulation of skeletal muscle contractions. The surface of the cerebrum, it's very folded, and it's covered with superficial layers of gray matter called the cerebral cortex. Now, if we examine the cerebral cortex in a little more de detail, we can see that the cerebral cortex, it's the gray matter of the cerebrum, as we mentioned, and it's more importantly responsible for all of the qualities associated with consciousness. Each hemisphere is concerned with the sensory and motor functions of the opposite sides of the body. So there's a contralateral function here. Now, even though uh, it's symmetrical in structure, the two hemispheres are not equal in function, and there is this lateralization or specialization of cortical function. Now, the right brain generally analyzes sensory information and relates the body to the sensory environment. Interpretive centers in this hemisphere enable you to identify familiar objects by touch and sight and smell and taste and feel. And according to a myth, Right-brained individuals, apparently, are more often artistic, musically inclined, uh, and attuned to their emotions, and 
as the myth goes, the left brain possesses the general interpretive and speech centers. And so it's important in language-based skills as well as writing and reading and speaking and math and, and logic. Now, the cerebral cortex contains three functional areas. There's a motor area, which controls voluntary motor functions, a sensory area, which provides conscious awareness of sensations, and association area, then, which integrates all sensory and motor information. No functional area of the brain acts alone, and conscious behavior involves the entire cerebral cortex in one way or another. So if you look at the motor areas of the cerebral cortex, you know, some of which are noted here on this slide, the primary motor cortex is located within the precentral gyrus of the frontal lobe, and this area possesses large neurons called pyramidal cells. We'll talk about that later. It also allows conscious control of skilled voluntary movements of skeletal muscles. The premotor cortex is located anterior to the precentral gyrus of the frontal lobe, and this region controls learned motor skills that are repeated or patterned. Say, for example, when you learn to play an instrument, you know, and many other, many other examples, many uh, skilled sports uh, as well. Um, some people might refer to this area as, or, or this phenomenon and uh, function as uh, muscle memory. Now, the premotor cortex also coordinates the movements of muscles simultaneously or sequentially by sending activating impulses to the uh, primary motor cortex. Uh, there's another area called Broca's area. Uh, it's known as the speech center and it's located anterior to the lower part of the premotor cortex. It's involved in directing motor speech, you know, including thinking as well, about planning to speak. Uh, and generally, it's present in only one hemisphere, typically the left one. Now, the frontal eye field is located anterior to the premotor cortex and superior to Broca's area that we just mentioned. Uh, this region controls voluntary movements of the eye, and it has no role in interpretation of vis uh, visual stimuli. Uh, this slide here shows some of the motor areas that we just talked about, but it also now shows some of the sensory and association areas. So while examining the sensory areas of the cerebral cortex, the first one that we want to talk about is the somatosensory cortex which is located in the parietal lobe of the cerebrum. The primary somatosensory cortex is a region uh, of that area, and it's located in the postcentral gyrus. Now, in this region, neurons receive touch information, uh, also temperature information you know, related to the touch is pressure, pain, and it comes from the somatic sensory receptors of the skin and from proprioceptors in skeletal muscle. This area ultimately allows for spatial discrimination, like interpreting what body region is being stimulated. The somatosensory association area, it lies posterior to the primary somatosensory cortex, and this region integrates and analyzes the somatic sensory inputs from the primary somatosensory cortex and memories as well of previous experiences, ultimately to produce an understanding about what is being felt. In other words, it allows you to recognize the cold and flat round thing in your pocket as a quarter, for example. Now, the visual cortex is located within the occipital lobe of the cerebrum. And also within the visual cortex, you find the primary visual cortex, which receives light information from the retina of the eye, obviously. You know, and information like color and form and texture will be accompanied by that. Um, and then you also have the visual association area, which integrates and analyzes the visual information coming from the primary visual cortex, as well as past experiences to interpret what the images actually mean. Another sensory area of the cerebral cortex is the auditory cortex, which is located within the temporal lobe. The primary auditory cortex ultimately receives sound information from the ear, like pitch and rhythm and volume. The auditory association area integrates and analyzes the information from the primary auditory cortex, and also uses past experiences to interpret the sound stimulus, um, you know, what it means. Now, other sensory areas uh, include things like the olfactory cortex, which is located on the medial aspect of the temporal lobe, and it's responsible for the conscious perception of odors or smells. We also have the gustatory cortex, which is located in the insula and 
also it's found in some portions of the frontal lobe as well and ultimately it's involved in conscious perception of taste and then you have the visceral sensory cortex which you might guess it's located in the insula and it's involved in conscious perception of the visceral sensations for example a full bladder or an upset stomach now there are also some interpretive areas of the cerebrum the prefrontal cortex which is also called the anterior association area is involved with intellect and complex learning abilities and recall and personality. This area, it's necessary, it's thought, for abstract ideas and judgment and reasoning and planning and concern for others, empathy, for example. Um, now, so it's understandable that if you have uh, a disability or a trauma or tumors in this area, it might lead to a personality disorder. Now, there is also a general interpretive area, uh, which is also called the posterior association area, and this area encompasses parts of the temporal and occipital and parietal lobes of one hemisphere, usually the left. Now this region integrates sensory and motor information with emotions and plays a role in recognizing patterns and faces, you know, localizing us to our surroundings, uh, and maybe binding different sensory inputs into coherent holes. It also actually contains Wernicke's area, which is involved in understanding written and spoken language and sounding out unfamiliar words. The basal nuclei is another important area of the brain, and this is where there are kind of little islands of gray matter located deep within the white matter of the cerebrum. The functions of these little islands of gray matter is to subconsciously control large, automatic skeletal muscle contractions, for example, your arms swinging when you're walking, or maybe playing a role in maintaining attention um, and to produce also dopamine. So you might guess that disorders of the basal nuclei can result in too much or too little uh, dopamine, which can alter the flow of movements. And you can see this in Huntington's disease, where too much is produced, or Parkinson's disease, where too little is produced. And the major component of the basal nuclei are the caudate, putamen, and globus pallidus. The diencephalon contains the hypothalamus and the thalamus. And the diencephalon serves as the structural and functional link between the cerebral hemispheres and the rest of the central nervous system. This region is completely covered by the cerebrum, uh, and it's so it's hard to see it. It's not visible through external examination. Now the thalamus, it forms the superior lateral walls of the third ventricle and it's composed of masses of gray matter held together by a midline of fibers known as the intermediate mass. It also contains important relay and processing centers for sensory information and almost all sensory input goes through the thalamus with the exception of olfaction. So the thalamus, it's sometimes called the gatekeeper. And just one other point here, the thalamus, it contains many nuclei, each projecting fibers and receiving fibers from specific regions of the cortex. So really it's an important structure and a relay center for, for sensory information. A couple points about the hypothalamus now. Uh, it forms the walls of the third ventricle and the walls of the hypothalamus meet and extend to form the infundibulum, which is the pituitary gland um, or, or rather this is where the pituitary gland is suspended from and there's a lot of interactions as we're going to see when we get to the endocrine chapter between the hypothalamus and the pituitary, the anterior and posterior. Now the hypothalamus, it serves as the main visceral control center. Some of the homo homeostatic roles of the hypothalamus and they're far reaching include things like autonomic control, we're going to learn more about that in the next few lectures, and as a result of that control, it will be able to influence blood pressure and heart rate and uh, GI or digestive tract motility, even respiratory rate, uh, rate and depth of breathing, pupil size. It's also the center for emotional responses and behavior, and it plays role in body temperature regulation. It can initiate, for example, both sweating and shivering and other responses that are important for maintaining deep body temperature. It can regulate food intake, it can alter water balance in the body and your thirst mechanisms. Uh, it even regulates your sleep and wake cycles and it releases hormones, as I mentioned, 
um, that can um, alter all of these things, many of these things, um, through the anterior pituitary. Well, like I said, we're going to talk more about those specific endocrine functions later on. Okay, on to the brainstem. Now, the brainstem includes the midbrain and the pons and the medulla oblongata, and only portions of the brainstem are actually visible underneath the cerebrum. Though this region is pretty small, it actually plays an extremely important role in nerve connections of the motor and sensory systems, uh, and ultimately, you know, from the rest of the body uh, to, to the upper, upper, upper areas of the brain, it's the main connector. Now, the midbrain contains nuclei that possess visceral and auditory information, and it controls reflexes that are triggered by these stimuli. And it also contains uh, some centers that help to maintain consciousness. We also have a structure called the corpora quadrigemina, which is made up of two nuclei on each side. You have superior colliculi, which contains the visceral, uh, the visual reflexes, and you know, for example, hand-eye coordination, and the inferior colliculi, which contain auditory and startle responses. You also have the substantia nigra. It's another portion that contains various amounts of uh, melanin. It also contains the precursor to dopamine, and so it regulates the activity of the basal nuclei of the brain stem. And so lesions to this area have been linked to Parkinson's disease, which you might have been able to, to, to hypothesize. The red nuclei contains large amounts of hemoglobin and iron, and ultimately it issues subconscious muscle commands that can affect upper limb position. And uh, it also has an influence on background muscle tone. And so all of those things are roughly related to the brainstem. Um, let's talk a little bit more, and the midbrain in particular, let's talk a little bit more about the pons uh, and the medulla oblongata. So the pons is located below the midbrain and above the medulla oblongata, and it possesses projections of fibers between the higher and lower brain centers, and also between the pons and the cerebrum. The pons also actually processes uh, or possesses nuclei that function in somatic and visceral motor control. Now, some pons nuclei are respiratory centers that help to maintain the normal rhythm of breathing just during resting conditions. Um, the medulla oblongata now, this is primarily responsible for relaying information to other portions of the brainstem and to the thalamus, the main gatekeeper in, in the brain for all information, sensory information. The medulla oblongata, it also contains major centers for regulating important autonomic functions like those of the hypothalamus. It controls the force and rate of heart contractions, for example. It regulates blood pressure by ultimately regulating smooth muscle of blood vessels, causing them to get bigger or get smaller. It's vasoconstriction or vasodilation as referred to. It can help regulate the depth and rate of breathing, and it can regulate visceral reflexes such as vomiting and hiccuping and swallowing and, and even sneezing. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the cerebellum. Now, the cerebellum is considered to be an autonomic processing center. It accounts for somewhere in the region of 11% of the whole brain's mass, so it's fairly large. Surprisingly, though, it's partially hidden by the cerebral hemispheres, and even though it's the second largest structure in the brain, it's hard to see. The cerebellum functions in the coordination and modulation of various motor commands from the cerebral cortex, and so it's important for maintaining things like balance and equilibrium. The cerebellum, it's actually separated from the cerebrum by transverse fissures, and it's divided into two hemispheres and then further uh, subdivided into lobes. You have the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe, and the two cerebellar hemispheres are separated by what's called the vermis, while the anterior and posterior lobes are separated by the primary fissure. Now, the white matter of the cerebellum is called arborvitae, and it's surrounded by gray matter called the cerebellar cortex. The spinal cord is shown in this slide, and you can see a cross-section of the spinal cord in particular, both histologically uh, and in the, in the figure here. Now, the adult spinal cord, it's about 18 inches in length and has a maximum width of somewhere in the region of just 14 millimeters. The spinal cord is located within the vertebral foramen, also known as the vertebral canal. Now, let's talk a little bit more about its anatomy.
So with the spinal cord, there's several anatomical regions that are significant. You have the cervical enlargement, and that supplies nerves to the shoulders and upper limbs. You have the lumbar enlargement, which provides innervation to the structures of the pelvis and the lower limbs. And then you have the conus medullaris, which is tapered, the conical portion of the spinal cord, uh, inferior to the lumbar enlargement. Now, because the adult spinal cord ends at the level of the first or second lumbar vertebra, the dorsal and ventral roots of the spinal cord segments L2 and S5 extend below that inferiorly. Now when looking at this in gross dissection, the phylum terminale and the long ventral and dorsal roots resemble a horse's tail, hence this region is known as the cauda equina. Uh, the phylum terminale, as you can see here, it's a slender strand of fibrous tissue that extends from the tip of the conus medullaris to the second sacral vertebrae. It provides longitudinal support to the spinal cord as a component of the coccygeal ligament. And so other parts of the spinal cord are shown here. The posterior median sulcus is a shallow longitudinal groove on the posterior or dorsal surface of the spinal cord. The anterior median fissure, it's a deep groove along the anterior or ventral surface. The central canal is a longitudinal passageway that extends the length of the spinal cord and it contains cerebral spinal fluid, very important. Uh, and the spinal cord contains gray matter and white matter. The gray matter is dominated by the cell bodies of neurons and neuroglia and unmyelinated axons and surrounds the narrow central canal forming, as you can see here, kind of a butterfly shape. The gray matter, it actually can be organized into structural and functional areas. The projections in the gray matter ultimately move toward uh, outer surfaces of the spinal cord called horns. And you can see those clearly here. Now specifically, the posterior gray horn contains somatic and visceral sensory nuclei. The lateral gray horn, which is located only in the thoracic and lumbar segments of the spinal cord, contains visceral and motor nuclei. The anterior gray horn contains somatic motor nuclei. Now the cell bodies of the neurons in the gray matter of the spinal cord are organized into functional groups called nuclei. Sensory nuclei receive and relay sensory information from the sensory receptors of the body to the central nervous system. Motor nuclei issue motor com commands rather to the peripheral effectors. Now the spinal cord also contains white matter. Now white matter contains large numbers of myelinated and some unmyelinated axons, uh, just like the gray matter. Uh, white matter can also be further subdivided into functional uh, areas and structural areas. Now more particularly, the structural components of white matter are divided into columns. The posterior white column lies between the posterior gray horns and the posterior median sulcus. The lateral white column includes the white matter on either side of the spinal cord between the anterior and the posterior columns. And the anterior white column lies between uh, the anterior gray horns and the anterior median fissure. The meninges of the spinal cord serve to cover and protect. The meninges here, they're rather delicate neural tissues that must be protected from shock as well, including damaging contact with the surrounding bone, the bony walls of the vertebral uh, canal. The spinal meninges are a series of specialized membranes surrounding the spinal cord and provide the necessary physical stability and shock, absorb and sh uh, shock absorption, rather. and they really consist of three layers. You have the tough fibrous dura mater, that's the outermost covering of the spinal cord. It contains dense collagen fibers that are oriented along the longitudinal axis of the cord between the dura mater then and the, and the walls of the ventral canal, you'll find the epidural space. And you can see here on this slide, um, this is the region that contains areolar connective tissue and blood vessels uh, and the protective padding of adipose tissue. Now, a narrow subdural space will separate the dura mater from the arachnoid mater. Now the arachnoid mater, it's the middle layer and it includes simple squamous epithelium and the subarachnoid space that extends between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. 
Now the Pia Mater consists of a meshwork of elastic and collagen fibers that's very strongly bound to the underlying neural tissue. The subarachnoid space contains arachnoid trabeculae, which is a network of collagen and elastic fibers that ultimately attach the arachnoid mater to the pia mater. It's filled with cerebral spinal fluid, which acts again as a shock absorber, and it also is a diffusion medium for gases and nutrients and chemical messengers and, and waste products. Now, just as an aside, in adults, the cerebral spinal fluid can safely be withdrawn in a procedure known as a lumbar puncture or a spinal tap, uh, where you have to insert a needle very carefully into the sub subarachnoid space in the lumbar region, just inferior to the tip of the conus uh, medullaris. And here you can see the uh, subarachnoid space and the uh, epidural space. And so we have cerebral spinal fluid, which we mentioned a couple of times before. It's produced actually in the choroid plexus and it circulates through the ventricles. And there are four ventricles of the brain. You have two lateral ventricles, a right and a left, each within one of the cerebral hemispheres. The third ventricle, it's located in the diencephalon. And the fourth ventricle begins in the mesencephalon and extends into the superior portion of the medulla oblongata. It then narrows and it is ultimately continuous with the central canal of the spinal cord. Now ultimately cerebral spinal fluid, it's reabsorbed into the blood where the arachnoid mem uh, membrane ultimately emerges into what's referred to as the dural sinuses. And a couple words about the blood-brain barrier. Now, this helps to maintain a stable environment for the whole central nervous system, and it has a distinct composition that's different from blood plasma. And most notably, there are fewer plasma proteins within the blood-brain barrier. It has actually a selective per permeability in the nutrients it contains, the wastes and toxins, and it's actually ineffective against fats and gases. Those can travel easily through the blood-brain barrier. Now, this blood-brain barrier is also absent in some regions in the body, for example, in the vomiting center. So what that means is the body can monitor the composition and if, for example, you were taking something toxic, could initiate the vomiting reflex. Okay, so the connective tissue sheaths are shown here and you can see the epineurium, which surrounds each nerve, the peri, which surrounds the fascicle or bundle of nerves, and the endoneurium, which surrounds the axon itself. So the epi is the outer and the endo, it's the deep within structure. Now nerves can be classified as either cranial or spinal and they're based on the direction of transmission. So sensory is going afferent, motor is efferent. Afferent is moving closer to your central nervous system, efferent is moving away. And we also actually have some mixed nerves as well. Now we're gonna be examining 12 pairs of cranial nerves uh, and we'll also have a quick look at some spinal nerves as well. The cranial nerves can be seen in this slide. Now, what you're looking at are the cranial nerves by name and number, and the cranial nerves are classified as either sensory or motor or mixed. If they're sensory, they contain sensory neurons only. Motor will contain motor neurons only and mixed, meaning that they contain both. The first two pairs you can see here attach to the forebrain, uh, and the remaining 10 pairs will attach to the uh, brainstem. So more precisely, these are the cranial nerves by name and number, as well as their function, which you will need to know. You know. For each of these cranial nerves, make sure that you can provide the name and number and a description of the function and be able to identify if it's sensory or motor or mixed. Okay, so let's talk about spinal nerves now. Uh, spinal nerves are named for their respective vertebrae. A spinal nerve is composed of bundles called fascicles, as we saw previously, and each fascicle is composed of numerous nerve cells called neurons, and there are three tissue layers, the epi being the outer, the peri being the middle, and the endo being the inner. That surrounds the nerves. And there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves, and all of the spinal nerves are mixed nerves. So the cervical plexus of the spinal nerves 
move C1 through C5, and this plexus is mostly cutaneous nerves that supply the skin. The phrenic nerve is the single most important cervical nerve that innervates the diaphragm for breathing. So you can understand how it's important. And you may actually be familiar with the mnemonic, C3, 4, 5 helps keep you alive. That's where the phrenic nerve originates from, C3 to C5. Uh, the brachial plexus that innervates the pectoral girdle and the upper limbs and consists of spinal nerve C4 through T1. Now the main nerves from the brachial plexus include the suprascapular nerve, the axillary nerve, and the radial nerve, and the ulnar nerve. They are named pretty much for the bones where they, where they go. And then you also have the, uh, the median nerve. Now the thoracic region does not form a plexus. None of the intercostal nerves are intertwined. You have 12 pairs of intercostal nerves that give rise to many cutaneous branches to the chest and torso area and innervate the external intercostal muscles for breathing. The lumbar plexus innervates the pelvic girdle and portions of the lower limbs and it arises from spinal nerves T12 through L4. The femoral nerve is the largest terminal nerve of the plexus and it branches to form uh, a couple different nerves on the medial knee and thigh. The obturator nerve is also part of this plexus and it innervates the adductor muscles of the leg. And then you have the sacral plexus from spinal nerves L4 to uh, S4. The largest branch of the sacral plexus is the sciatic nerve, which you might have heard of. It supplies the entire lower limb except the anterior medial thigh. Uh, and then you have one coccygeal. I just wanted to finish off by talking about some imbalances associated with the nerves, and some of those are shown here. So chicken pox or shingles is a virus that can remain dormant within nerves. Uh, you may suffer from chicken pox as a child, and then the virus can remain dormant and show up later as an adult as shingles. Another, fainting or syncope, lightheadedness, is where you have a decrease in blood flow to the brain. It may result in passing out, feeling faint. Stroke is where you can suffer a lack of oxygen to different regions of the brain and brain cells may die along with the tissue and a whole bunch of functions depending upon where that tissue is located. Uh, and there are various forms of meningitis or inflammation of the meninges uh, and you have spina bifida which is an incomplete closing of the backbone and the membranes around the spinal cord. Now spina bifida is not as common because uh, of the recommendation primarily for, for pregnant women or women planning to become pregnant to increase their folic acid intake. So that's it for this video lecture on the nervous system, focusing primarily on the central nervous system and um, the peripheral nervous system. Next time, we're gonna be talking more about somatic uh, nerves and the somatic nervous system. So we'll see you then.